worship this morning. For those of you in the sanctuary and those online, um, welcome once again. We're going to begin here in a moment, as we normally do, with uh, praises the offering, a little bit one that uh, we'll raise up to the Lord, and then another song, and have the word preached, and uh, communion, and then end up with another song after that. But just thinking uh, this morning um, a little bit just to begin our times, maybe you're aware and maybe you're not, um, some of the couple things that I was made aware of through some other uh, studies, if you will, prophecy continues to be fulfilled. And even as we speak, um, or I speak at the moment, um, relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel are coming together. They talk about the Arab Emirates Republic coming together. Sudan is now making those strides to bring things together. And if you go back into prophecy, some of those things are the things that need to take place before Christ returns again. Or if you will, the rapture happens first and then he returns after that. Um, and I don't know where all this situation, the chaos of the world is, comes into all of that. None of us do. But it's very interesting to how these things are falling into place for those that are in tune with what the Bible is talking about. But in and amongst that, we're called to worship. We're called to gather. And uh, glad you're here. And like I said, for those that are online, if you want to stand with us, if you are able, and we are going to begin with praise as the offering. Father, you are worthy. <laughs> Oh 
As we bring our prayers to you in this place, Father God, receive and give as you so infinitely wisdomly gift us. For we're here and we're yours. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all of God's people say, Amen. And church family, you may be seated. Don't forget the prayer sheets that are in your um, pews. They can be put in the offering plate that's in the back. Um, but the session and the staff take those seriously, and we pray about those each week. And so um, if there's a concern, if there's a praise, if there's unspoken request, whatever you feel that needs to go to God, put it on that sheet, and we'll take care of it this week when we pray. Um, Church offices are closed tomorrow for the Labor Day holiday, so just wanted to remind you about that. Um, Tuesday, we begin to kick in with some Bible studies. Um, women's uh, precepts class begins Tuesday at 9.30, and the men's Bible study begins Tuesday at 10.30. And so be aware of that. Those are kicking in. The Tuesday morning prayer and Bible study group won't start until October, but they'll be kicking in then. My online class, which is 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Jude, starts a week from Monday, and it'll be online, it'll be on that Facebook page, you have to join that Facebook page, so if you know need some help joining that group, let me know, but it'll be online hopefully every Monday by 9, and then you can access it anytime after that, you don't have to be on at 9 a.m. on Mondays, but you can do it 9 p.m. on Mondays, you can do it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whenever, um, and so we'll be kicking that in next, a week from Monday. Um, a couple pastoral care concerns, um, a praise actually. Bob Krismer started his um, first round of cancer treatment, and he did really well. There were some issues there. They weren't sure how well he would do, and he did great. Um, many of you know Susie Osborne from the Great Banquet community. Um, went through a whole series of cancer treatments last year, and her cancer has returned. And so uh, she's going through a series of surgeries right now and then probably some treatments. Um, so keep Susie uh, in your prayers. Any other prayer concerns or announcements today? All right, Don, come on up. Can he steal a mic? It's on. Just kind of curious. I like what you said today. Israel, a peace. The Middle East, a peace. Sign of the times. How many people, seriously, how many people think the coming is close? How many of you know somebody that's not ready? Amen. Keep your mic up closer to your mouth. Thank you. <laughs> Keep reminding me. I'll get it right one of these days. It is <laughs> okay. a time of prayer. I'll start it out. And as I think we all know, when you're done, in your mercy, the response will be, Lord, hear our prayers. And then, you know, it's, you can go next if you want to. So hopefully it'll be a time that we feel God's presence. So Heavenly Father, we do come to you today. We know this is your day. We know that nothing's going to happen this day that you don't already know about. But Father, we want to lift up those that we do know that aren't ready for your coming. Open our eyes to ways we can reach him, speak to them minister to them. Teach us how to pray for them, Lord. It's the Lord's prayer for the disciples saying, teach us how to pray. But Lord, I pray they teach us how to pray for others. Teach us how to pray for those that, that don't know you. How to witness to them. 
how to share your grace and mercy. And Father, I pray for this country. I cannot think of a time in history where we had so much chaos, so much confusion, so many attacks. And there's only one hope, and we know you're it. So Father, please hear our prayers as we pray for this country, for the leadership. Lord, sometimes it looks like four-year-olds in the playground arguing and bickering. Your fault, his fault, their fault. Lord, give us a heart to quit worrying about whose fault it was and start seeking the true answer. How do you give this country back to you? And Father, we pray for those that are in search of trying to find a new pastor for this congregation. I pray, Lord, that you open their eyes to, to the candidate that you have already made for us, that you've already ordained. Let those that are in search see the one through your eyes, hear his words through your heart. I know the one you've given is the one that'll, that'll be behind the pulpit. So, Father, I ask you now to hear the prayers of your people. In your mercy, Lord. Hear our prayers. Mighty God, Labor Day. Sunday, Lord, I just ask that um, we lift up those men and women who. Uh, Frankly, we recognized a lot this year as essential workers, um, people that you don't normally see and hear, and, um, and sometimes we don't appreciate very much. And Lord, I just pray for them, and I pray that um, a lot of people are hurting financially this year and with employment issues, and I just pray that that improves over the next few months and will continue to improve, that people will get back to work and um, things will get a little easier and that COVID um, finds its way out the door. Um, though I'm not optimistic about that happening soon, but you can do anything. Gracious God, I just thank you also for the people of the church who work behind the scenes, the worker bees, and um, all those who do things that nobody else knows about. And Lord, I'm thankful for them as well on this Labor Day Sunday, and uh, I appreciate them because this church wouldn't function. No church would function uh, without them. So many people do so many things that nobody knows about for your kingdom. And Lord, I celebrate them and I'm thankful for them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Hear our prayers. Father, we thank you for the day you've given us. We pray, Lord, that as we go through the service today, that we open our hearts, receive what you have for us. And Father, as we pray, me and Barry prayed earlier today, let this day be, even as your day of Pentecost, that your spirit changed the 
plans for the day. Your spirit took over because of willing hearts that would let it. So Father, soften our hearts. Let us be a vessel that you can work through. And what we hear here today, what you give us today, Lord, let us take to those that don't know how close the end is or how close the second coming is. Father, let this be your day and let us be your servants. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Next week, I begin my final sermon series as your installed pastor. Um, it's called Final Thoughts, Words from the Heart. Uh, every sermon in that series is based out of Paul's letter to the Philippians. Um, I haven't done a lot of that, actually, in my ministry where I preached through an entire book and um, was challenged to do that and uh, thought that would be my last volley into your lives and your hearts. Um, today's message is kind of a prequel to that series. It ties in themes, um, but isn't based on Philippians. Um, but as this church begins to focus past my 12 plus years of ministry among you, I want to set you up to succeed in the coming transition. We need to approach things from a hopeful, anticipatory attitude. This is not a time to sit back. It's not a time to... Um, Take it easy and just coast and see what God's going to do. Um, it's a time to engage. It's a time to engage if you want in church to stay and remain healthy and become healthier overall. So this time of transition is an opportunity. And I believe God has great plans for this church. But again, we need to engage in this time, not get complacent, not sit back, not just wait for God to move and do his thing. Now, I have to affirm God is moving. But he expects us to be moving too. To be about his business and the work of his kingdom in an intentional way. And in this age of COVID-19, I also believe we need to do it as safely as we can. But I firmly believe... We need to kick in and continue to do ministry and continue to be about the work of Jesus Christ. So I hope the words on this Labor Day weekend will be helpful to you. One day, Jesus was attending the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a celebration of the remembrance of the years the Hebrew people wandered in the wilderness before entering the Promised Land. And at this feast, Jesus proclaims that whoever believes in him Rivers of living water will flow from them. When you think about that, you would think flow to you is what you would think. You know, he's going to bless you. You're going to get filled up. That's not what he said. Is that rivers of living water will flow from you. From you. We find this in John 7, 37 to 39. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. What a wonderful image that that is. There's a river of living water, not a babbling brook, not a slow-moving stream, but I believe a raging, gushing, whitewater-filled river. That's my picture of the Spirit working. It's kind of like when you've seen pictures of a raging flood. Kind of that image. If the Holy Spirit is involved in your life and in this church, if Jesus Christ is the center and focus of your existence and the church's existence, then Jesus says a raging river of blessing and goodness and transforming power will flow from you and from this church to 
others. To others. The promise is that you and this church will be a vital part of fulfilling God's work wherever you are. You're going to be enabled to accomplish things for God that you never dreamed possible before if the Spirit's working in you and through you. And that's because you're allowing the Spirit to use you in some new and some mighty ways. Jesus uses this image of a raging river, I think, to make a point. His followers are not to be stagnant pools of calm tranquility. And that's something we strive for. We want to be tranquil. We want to be content. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But a stagnant pool of calm tranquility isn't who and what he wants us to be. To be stagnant means there's no movement forward. No affecting of others. Usually stagnant pools that I'm aware of anyways grow algae. Often can smell badly. Um, sometimes full of rotting stumps and deteriorating growth, and they tend to be on the decline and lead to death. Jesus wants his followers to be growing, to be affecting others, full of life, to be generous givers of all they have been given. A stagnant pool keeps all it gets. And it affects and transforms. Excuse me. And it doesn't affect or transform anyone downstream because there is no downstream it's all about them it's all about us that's a dangerous place for a church to be and an individual to be it guarantees church death a raging river passes on all that it gets and affects and transforms everything along its way So Jesus wants this church and all people of God to be like this raging river, full of life and excitement, always moving forward, affecting and transforming all those that we meet and greet along life's path. A raging river gives all it has as it passes its blessing on to those downstream. A raging river is generous as it gives itself away 100% every day, 100% every day. But also, you need to realize that the raging river, which gives itself away 100% every day, is replenished 100% every day. Where a stagnant pool, which gives nothing away, gets nothing new in to renew it. And because the river gives away its treasure, itself, it's renewed and it's full of life. And because the stagnant pool gives nothing away and hoards what it has, it is not renewed, it is diseased, and often dying. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 15, we get another visual image. This is a long passage, but I uh, want to read it to you. It should be somewhat familiar. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. We're not talking just money here. We're not talking just seeds here. Be aware of that. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase, catch that, your store of seed, and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that, here's the application part, you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace of God has given to you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. 
So instead of a raging river, we're given an image of a farmer planting his crops. The farmer can only harvest what he plants. As Paul states, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. In other words, you reap what you sow. If we plant sparingly or with great caution or think in the spring, I can't afford the seed, I can't afford to do ministry, I can't afford to be about the work of God, then in the fall you're not going to have much to harvest. You won't be able to support your family, your basic needs, or the work of the church or the work of the kingdom. And friends, the same is true for the church here, is that if we sow sparingly, if we never take a risk, if we think only of ourselves and our own needs first as a congregation, we abandon mission and we abandon the work of God, we will fail. It's pretty clear. And the harvest will fail. And we will not be used by God in a mighty way. This passage from 2 Corinthians reminds us that the seed itself, the ground itself, money itself, time, talent, energy, love, affirmation, the future of the church itself, all come from God. God is the source, not you and me. And God will meet our needs if we are faithful to him and his cause. Remember verse 10 and 11 states, Now he who supplies, God's giving to us, Seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that, all this stuff happens so that, you can be generous on every occasion, on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. People will be thankful for the work of God through you in the world. In other words, God blesses us and gives us good things so that we can sow generously, so we can flow like that raging river and have huge impact downstream. God is the source of all we have. We are not the source. All we have, though, is meant to be used to help others, to accomplish God's work, to meet our basic needs and to meet the basic needs of somebody else. Friends, if we're honest, we can say, I think most of us can say, we've been given more than we need. We've been given more than we need. So we can be generous in doing God's work and helping others. In other words, we trust God to provide for us, and in doing so, that trust leads us to be generous in our giving of time and talent and affirmation and support and money, ministry, doing the work of Jesus Christ. And it also means we trust God with our future. One other thought comes from first, excuse me, Second Corinthians. Paul writes, each one should give not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God wants us to give and be generous. And again, this isn't just about money. That's part of it, but that's not the whole picture. But he wants us to give not reluctantly. Not from this sense of, well, it's that time of year again, stewardship time in the church, and I got to give. Yay. Not a bit of joy in that, is there? Um, God wants us to give cheerfully and joyfully, knowing that a great work will come out of what God does through us, whether we're able to give a large amount or a small amount. But if we give reluctantly, under compulsion, we're acting like the stagnant pool. If we're giving cheerfully and generously and joyfully, we're like that raging river that... In, um, affects and transforms all it touches as it flows downriver. We're going to move to a third image. Our Daily Bread, a devotional magazine, had another visual image to help us with the idea of giving and helping us to accomplish, to figure out a way to accomplish God's work in the world in this time, in this place, 
and in this situation. And the author believed that there's three kinds of givers, three attitudes towards being used by God in ministry. I'm going to read this to you. And he writes, There are three kinds of givers, the flint, the sponge, and the honeycomb. To get anything from the flint, you must hammer it. And even then, you generally only get chips and sparks. It gives nothing away if it can help it, and even then, only with great display. To get anything from the sponge, you must squeeze it. It is good-natured. It readily yields to pressure. And the more it is pressed, the more it gives. Still, one must press. To get anything from the honeycomb... One must only take what flows from it. It takes delight in giving without pressure, without begging and badgering. It gives its sweetness freely. He goes on to write, there's another difference in the honeycomb. It's a renewable resource. Unlike the flint or the sponge, the honeycomb is connected to life. It is the product of ongoing work and creative energy. One of the reasons honeycomb givers are able to give freely is that they're aware that Their lives are continually being replenished. Their lives are continually being replenished. They believe that what they give away will soon be regenerated. As long as you are connected to the source of all giving, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the promise is you're never going to run dry. When you give freely, you'll receive in like manner. So the author goes on to finish. He writes, I want to be a honeycomb giver. I want to be one who can give freely to anyone, no matter who they are or what they've done to me, and know that I will be replenished. I know that I have the source of all life. He lives within me as the Holy Spirit and moves within my heart to tell me what to do. Then he asks a question. What do you try to give? When you are asked to give, does the Holy Spirit have to work on you like the flint or the sponge? Or does the Holy Spirit say, give, and you say, okay. So the two passages of Scripture I've been working from today, John 7 and 2 Corinthians 9, tell us clearly and unequivocally that God wants us to be honeycomb givers in all areas of our lives. Freely giving what we have, knowing that we're connected to the source of um, all life, and that what we give is going to be replenished so we can keep on giving more. This is what a life of faith looks like. This is living water flowing from us to the world. If we claim to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must live by faith, trust him to replenish us, meet our needs as we give to him in his work, as we impact people's lives for the kingdom. If we don't trust him to replenish us and meet our needs as we give to him in his work, if we don't trust him with the future of our own church, we're not living by faith. It says we don't trust God. We trust only pretty much in ourselves, and frankly, I'd rather trust God than to trust solely in myself, for by myself I know I'm going to fail at some point or another. I'm going to fall short. God never will. So I want to be, and I want this church to be, honeycomb givers, a raging river for God. A farmer who sows with gusto in expectation of a great harvest. A source of living water for the world and the Bryan community. (coughs) It isn't just for this church when we give. Life is so much better and fuller when we live generous lives and when we give all we have and are to God for him to use. Grace and goodness will flow from our lives and from our church and make a real difference in the world. That is the only way to be a healthy church. It's the only way to be a healthy church. So ask yourself, am I sowing with gusto? 
Am I a stagnant pool or a raging river for God in what I offer to God? Is, are things flowing from me into the lives of others? Am I like the flint or the sponge or the honeycomb? Do I give reluctantly or under compulsion? Or do I give joyfully, expectantly, and cheerfully? And in some ways, I believe that the future of this church depends on how we respond. And if we're open to being used by the Holy Spirit as a family of faith. So let's get busy and be that raging river for God in all we do and say and give. Allow God to flow out of you into the world. Because only good can come from that. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to the table today, we come recognizing that the giver of all, the greatest giver of all, gave himself, gave everything 100% to you and to me. He gave us Jesus, who is God in human form, who died on the cross so that we might be saved, so that we might have life, so that we might be resurrected, so that we might join him in mission and ministry wherever we go and wherever we find ourselves. Remember that as you take him into yourself this day. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took the bread. After giving thanks to God, he blessed it and broke it, saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat remembering me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, which is given for the remission of sin. Whenever you drink of it, drink of it, remembering me. Maybe this cup is the raging river of blessing and goodness because it's the cup of life. The blood of Jesus, the blood of God sacrificed 100% for you. And I think his expectation is we pass that on. Let us share communion together if you already haven't. family we're going to conclude uh, or this portion singing it's if you want to stand with us the song is titled no one but you we've done it a number of times during this communion time as you go through it uh, singing out these words may they bless you and bless him in a special way no one but you Search the 
somebody else and that goes for communion that goes for your blood your life your body Lord continue to be at work in us transform us and change us and resurrect us where we need it and as a result of that change and restoration and transformation help us to be your hands and feet in somebody else's life this week gracious God we thank you for your love and your grace for sending Jesus to the cross for we would have no hope otherwise. Now sing of your love I can't get enough I just want you The Lord of my soul about God, not really about us. And we, his church, are called to represent him in the world. To be hands and feet and mouthpiece, yes, but to be a raging river, to be a farmer who sows with gusto, to be a honeycomb giver in all aspects of life. Because we have been so blessed, we have been so touched, we have received so much, more than we need and can contain that we can do nothing else but let it flow downstream to benefit Brian and Ohio, the United States, and the world. That's why we're here. 
be that raging river for God. In Jesus' name, amen.